Nina, your your last line, I'm just going to read it again so people understand like how genius this is. You said, there's nothing more delicious than pretending to be good while acting in a sadistic manner. And um, I just think that that's it's really, really deep. And I think it came up in all three of our presentations, this idea of sort of the pleasures of sadism in the name of some sort of ideology um, and and the role of acting um, in all of this. I, I really had never thought of that. So thank you both so much. Just totally, totally brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really humbled to be here. I'm humbled to be in such august company with my fellow panelists, um, both of whom I admire so much. Um, you asked me to speak for 15 to 20 minutes. I don't know that I'm going to get that far. I'm amazed that I have 10 minutes worth to say on this. I just want to scream. So I did my best to put those feelings and thoughts into words. Um, and with that, I will start. Um, as the images started to float oh, in on, on social media of the beautiful dancers at the Nova Festival who had been massacred by Hamas, I remember thinking that surely this would be a turning point in how the left views Israel. The images of these innocent, peace-loving, dancing youths, gorgeous and lithe with their long flowing hair and barely their festival outfits, read to me like some kind of updated ad for the Zionist state in 1947. The scenes from before the festival uh, radiated love and kindness, that 10 second clip of Shani Luke dancing. You watch it and you think, this is what they fought for. And then there's the image of Shani Luke on the back of that truck and the one of her being dragged through the streets of Gaza, thousands cheering and running after her desecrated body. Can you even imagine a starker contrast of good versus evil? It was joy, love, life versus violence, rape, and death. Surely, I thought in my naivete, the left would see themselves reflected in these music-loving young people who looked like they had stepped out of the hate ashbury in the 70s. Surely Noah Argamani begging for her life as the butchers ride off with her would inspire in the left a sense of identification and a corresponding sense of fear and anger. How could it not? Friends, it did not. Leftist women found nothing in their hearts to say about it for months. There was a total failure of the international feminist community to stand up for the Israeli women who had been brutalized by Hamas in a particularly sexual way. Despite the preponderance of evidence, there was a code of silence from the usual suspects. Some would even deny it. YouTube personalities formed what I like to call an our Hamas would never brigade to defend the butchers and the rapists from the evidence of their crimes, insisting it was all war propaganda. Now, this would be bad enough. But you have to remember, these women, these publications, these YouTube personalities, you have to remember who they are. These aren't people who in general feel that one should have a high standard of evidence before making an accusation of rape. The exact opposite is true. These are the people who demanded that all standards around evidence for accusations of sexual assault be completely suspended. These are the people who demanded that a standard of affirmative consent be deployed to judge whether a woman had consented to sex. And without that affirmation, any sexual encounter was to be deemed rape. These are the people who recoded bad sex as rape, sex one regretted as rape, flirtation as harassment, regrettable kissing as assault. And then they turned around and said, well, does shooting nails into a woman's vagina truly count as rape? Does chopping off a woman's breasts really count as a sexual war crime? Would our Hamas, who after all are very religious people, ever rape anybody? Never mind that Hamas had filmed themselves committing these atrocities, had bragged about them, had GoPro'd them, and sent the images to these women's families. Never mind that they had little booklets with helpfully translated phrases into Hebrew, like, take off your pants. The left was silent. The feminists were AWOL. How could this possibly be? How could it be that just six years after the Me Too movement, which gave voice to the outrage women felt at being sexually harassed at work, which upended gender relations and wreaked havoc on workplace after workplace because men had complimented their female co-workers, how could it be that these same women who demanded believe all women could turn around and say, actually, 
don't believe the confessions of terrorist rapists. The same women who demanded men be fired for asking women out and driven from public life for having consensual sex with underlings were now defending with their words or with their silence the mass rape of Israeli women, siding with men who had driven nails into women's vaginas and cut off their breasts to play with them. The same women and organizations who, tu who turned flirting at the office into the civil rights issue of our time when presented with evidence of the mass rape of Jewish women immediately began to say, we need more context. We need more evidence. Remember the plight of the true victims here who it turned out were the perpetrators. They took their standard of believe all women and turned it on a dime to don't believe the bragging of rapists because their victims were Jews. And this isn't just on the leftist fringe, unfortunately. On CNN, Dana Bash asked Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, who I believe is the head of the Progressive Caucus, she said to her, I have seen a lot of progressive women, generally speaking, that are quick to defend women's rights and speak out against using rape as a weapon of war, but downright silent on what we saw on October 7th and what might be happening inside Gaza right now to these hostages. Why is that? She asked Pramila Jayapal, to which Jayapal replied, I think that rape is horrific. Sexual assault is horrific. I think that it happens in war situations. Terrorist organizations like Hamas obviously are using these as tools. However, I think we have to be balanced about bringing in the outrages against the Palestinians. 15,000 Palestinians have been killed in Israeli airstrikes, three quarters of whom are women and children, she said, because our Hamas would never lie about such a thing. Meanwhile, the New York Times, which had an extensive article outlining the mass rapes, then shelved an episode of its popular podcast, The Daily, about the rapes due to internal pressure from its leftist newsroom, which apparently is chock full of members of the Our Hamas Would Never Brigade. The New York Times refused to stand by its own reporting when its sociopathic woke employees demanded that their audience be protected from knowing about this. How is this happening? It's easy to say this is just anti-Semitism. And I want to be clear. Of course, it's deeply fucking anti-Semitic. There's also the political calculation of trying to satisfy multiple constituencies and the fact that, and I think this is very important, the women's movement has been severely weakened by the transgender agenda, which has gotten women used to being asked to defend transgender rapists, for example, in prisons, or transgender athletes beating up women in sports. I think that being forced to defend this has had a huge impact on the women's movement. But it goes beyond that to the core of leftist ideology, which is built on a belief system that has erased the difference between right and wrong. Now, this belief system is one you will know well if you have been to a university in the last 40 years or an American newsroom or on TikTok or in a meeting with any cultural institution in America or any progressive organization, including any liberal Jewish organization, or if you're on the board of a museum or even in a writer's room in Hollywood. People call it critical race theory or Marxism or social justice. I call it wokeness. Wokeness is when you take a worldview that was once based on the difference between right versus wrong, virtue versus, virtue versus evil, and you replace it with a worldview that does not distinguish between right versus wrong, but instead suggests that the world is built on the primary binary of powerful versus powerless. They ascribe inherent virtue to those they see as powerless and evil to those they see as powerful. And they superimpose some characteristic onto the binary, whether it's race or gender or sexuality or national origin or religion, rendering all people, for example, who they see as people of color, powerless and oppressed and thus virtuous and all white people, powerful oppressors who are inherently evil and compromised. Um, this woke worldview absolutely dominates the left, which means it dominates the cultural and intellectual output of the United States these days. Once our elites were eager to offend the powers that be with their art and their scholarship or their journalism, now they will conform at all costs. And the thing they conform to is the view that people of color are inherently virtuous no matter what they do because they have no agency and are oppressed and marginalized while white people are inherently evil, the root of everything bad and responsible for any ills that befall us. 
this is the source of 21st century leftist anti-Semitism. Every Jew is coded as white and thus they are the oppressors and thus they are bad. And every Palestinian is coded as a person of color and thus oppressed and thus inherently virtuous. And that includes Hamas. Every Palestinian outranks every Jew on the oppression scale and thus any Palestinian in conflict with any Jew is the one the left must side with. The Jew has all the agency and is the oppressor and the Palestinian has no agency and is the oppressed. Anything bad that happens between them must ergo be the Jew's fault because you cannot blame someone with no agency for anything. They are an innocent like a child. To the woke, the less powerful has no responsibility to act ethically because their rank on the oppression scale means they cannot act at all. And thus they are inherently imbued with virtue no matter what they do. Their abjection is their virtue. And that goes for the terrorists among them as well. Because to the woke, people of color have no agency when a so-called person of color commits a heinous act against a so-called white person, the agency of their actions must be reassigned to their victims who have no who have agency. What this means is that when a Palestinian rapes a Jewish woman, the agency was hers. It was not his. She remains the oppressor. His act was her fault and her suffering does not release her from the burden of her status as oppressor even in death. That is why leftist feminists cannot side with raped Israeli women. To do so is to betray everything they believe. They truly see the Israeli women as deserving of everything that happened to them and having brought it on themselves. Like the conservatives of yore who blamed rape on the miniskirt worn by the victim, the left today blames the fact that Israel has more power than Hamas for everything Hamas does. They simply cannot think their way out of seeing Hamas as virtuous because to do so would be to admit that their entire worldview is not only wrong, but is fucking disgusting. Why didn't the images of the Nova martyrs move the left? Because the left has moved on from things like peace and love and dancing and eros and joy and beauty and truth and goodness. It has replaced all of these values with one value, abjection. The left today views beauty, love, peace, and joy as anathema. They have replaced them with an embrace of ugliness, of hatred, of resistance by any means necessary and a rejection of the joyous sexuality one finds at a music festival. And that is why the images that I assumed would draw sympathy only serve to cast the Israelis as further worthy of condemnation. The Israelis dancing at that festival didn't know they were evil oppressors. They didn't know that any calamity that would befall them was deserved, instigated even by their joyous existence. Their agency itself was a crime. At the end of the day, October 7th revealed how little of the left's ideology is about values and how much of it is about power, specifically about using abjection as a method of wielding power. That is the entire game plan of the left. Masquerade as having no agency as a strategy for grabbing power. Bray about being marginalized as a way of silencing dissent. Screech about how you are so oppressed as a way of firing your boss and getting their job or casting your political opponents out as unworthy of even the franchise, which is something we see in America very loud and clear today. And that is why the left just can't quit Hamas. They recognize their move when they see it, even when it shows up as a raping Hamas butcher. Hashem yikom damam. Thank you so much. Voila. Kol hakavod. Hakot achoti. I'm sure the audience has many thoughts to share in discussion about what we've heard i can't thank you enough and now we turn to our next speaker mariam and marcedegi uh Bhatia, that was outstanding and um that your words will stay with me for a long long time um uh, my name is Maryam Mimar Sadegi, and uh, I feel it necessary to to introduce myself a little bit only because um it's just a little bit different, this panel, than others I've spoken on. I'm not Jewish. And um, as Gabi said, I was born in Iran and came to the United States when I was seven years old during the 
1979 revolution. I come from um, a Muslim family, but not really. I mean, mostly um, atheists, really, but my background is um, is Muslim. Um, and I consider October 7th, um, from the moment that I saw the images of the of the concert, the fleeing from the concert, the worst thing that's happened in my lifetime. And um, and when I think about it, even now with some with a little bit of distance, for me, uh, viscerally, um, physically, it uh, I have a worse reaction than when I think about the gas chambers of the Holocaust. And a little bit of my background, um, I founded and ran for a decade a uh, civic education institution for uh, Iranians, um, reaching them through. Uh, the internet and social media and online classrooms and trying to get by the censorship of the of the regime in Iran. And among the things we taught was a history of the Holocaust, because, of course, this is censored. And um, the Holocaust is something that I've had an interest in my life. So I, I say that um, because of it. For me, this this um, um, the sexual violence of October 7th against Israeli uh, women by Hamas terrorists is, is for me worse. Um, um, long time ago, when I was in graduate school at University of Massachusetts Amherst, I went to a, 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 a talk at Smith College um, by a woman, Beverly Allen, who wrote a book called Rape Warfare. And listening to her talk, I realized that it's the first time I'd ever even heard about um, rape as a tool of war. And it was interesting because I was studying feminist theory and you'd think maybe I would have been exposed by that point to the horrors of rape in, in war and, and sexual violence, but I wasn't. I, I was sort of at that moment in time in the thick of postmodern uh, Judith Butler type um, uh, I, the beginnings of identity politics and a kind of feminism that really, when I look back now, has nothing to do with the feminism that came that came before it. Anyway, that woman's book, Rape Warfare, inspired me to go to the um, Balkan region where I worked as a humanitarian aid worker for three years and got to know women and really young women, very young women who had been uh, raped and serially raped in uh, the war in Kosovo, and I knew that the same thing had happened to to women in Bosnia and Croatia prior to that. And I, from that, from then, this is this is 1999. Kept thinking to myself, what is this feminism that doesn't touch the su this subject that is the worst of all of the experiences that women a, women can have, a woman can have. And uh, with time, I became more involved, more and more involved in the human rights movement in Iran. And I learned more about something that Iranians don't talk about much because it's so painful. And that is that um, girls and women who were political prisoners, particularly in the 1980s, before they were executed, they were systematically raped. And they were raped because in uh, 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 Shia Islam, uh, and maybe Islam writ large, um, a woman who's a girl who's a virgin can't can't go to hell uh, if she's a virgin. In other words, um, the rapists, the terrorists, the regime, um, prison guards would rape these girls and women to make sure that they don't go to heaven when when they're executed. And I got to know. Re sorry. I got to know recently someone whose family member, because of the woman life freedom revolution in Iran, a lot of these things came up very cathartically and people started to, Iranians started to speak about things that they hadn't spoken about uh, really ever maybe. And she told me about a, a family member who was in prison at the time before the 1988 prison massacre that took the lives of many thousands of Iranians in Iran, the order of the uh, leader of the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini. 
and a young girl whose family would come and visit her on prison visits on a regular basis. And uh, she would tell uh, close to the time when, when she thought that the execution was nearing, she told her family um, not to look at her body after she was executed and um, to just bury her and not look at her body and that that was her request from her family. The reason I mention it is because on those family visits, her family knew that she was being raped. She was being continually raped while she was in prison. That is the situation that we find ourselves now with the women and girls who are still held captive in Israel by Hamas. In real time, we saw them being raped. And now in real time, we know that they continue to be raped. And yet this is the discourse. This is the the denialism of um, not just regular people um, in the West and in, in academia, but people like Judith Butler, who are really the, the big queens of uh, feminism. Uh, I was at a bookstore last night here in Washington, D.C., politics and prose, and I was looking around. I wasn't even looking to to be picky about this, but I was looking around and thinking if somebody wanted to to grab some books to teach their students about what women in Israel might be experiencing right now, there's just very little here. There's very little here to buy. Um, on the other side, however, there's so much about the virtues of hijab, Palestinian resistance, uh, what jihad is really about, how you're misunderstanding it all. Um, so I think a moral clarity is hard to come by. And it's amazing to me that, you know, Iranians see this stuff and talk about it and write about it, but people in the West who don't suffer from censorship won't. And uh, for example, you know, Israel is bad, but Assad and his, you know, killing of over 500,000 people, including by some accounts, more Palestinians than Israel has ever killed, <laughs> Um, is not bad, uh, is not really even worth talking about that much in academia, not even really worth writing, you know, scholarly books and teach having classes about. Or Khamenei and the Iranian regime are somehow justified in their hatred. By the way, the Supreme Leader Khamenei, he tweeted immediately showing a, the, a video of the concert and, and the young people running in fear and uh, celebrated it on Twitter. An American American platform X and Houthis, um, people going out into the streets in Western um, cities. They're not just expressing their, you know, sympathy, solidarity with Palestinians. They're celebrating the Houthis. I mean, look at this group and what they stand for. Um, so. It seems to me that the worst places in the world where women are suffering the most because they're women, suffering the worst forms of violence, um, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, are ignored by the West. And uh, until now, it had for me this explanation of, well, it's a cultural relativism and they don't consider us really human. And so we're not really worth talking about. Whereas the, the microaggressions at Harvard and Yale and all of that, that's, that's to be expected, that's, that's understandable because they're, they're women of a much higher caliber. But now that this has happened October 7th and, 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 and the violence against Israeli women was, was broadcast in a way and made visible in a way that the violence against Afghan women and Iranian women never has been, I realized that it's something even more sinister than that because Israeli women had equality, have equality. They live under a democratic government. It's aligned with the United States. There's a Western lifestyle. There's modernity. There's liberalism. And yet still they suffer this. And yet still in the West, uh, there is a denialism. There is an unwillingness to acknowledge what reality is. And as Abad just said, even blame uh, the victims for what the perpetrators are doing. Um, I don't think this audience needs to be reminded of this, but the regime in Iran, the Islamic Republic has always intended and wanted for October 7th to happen. 
So it has been at, at the core of its ideology for Israel to be attacked, for Israel to be destroyed, for Jews to be massacred, and for women, Israeli women in particular, to be humiliated as they have been. So we have to recognize that an evil regime has achieved one of its number one objectives with October 7th. And yet, um, well, at the very least, um, Biden's policy of appeasement of that regime has continued. There has been no reckoning that the policy on that particular regime needs to be adjusted if it is backing the perpetrators of the massacre and rapes. Um, because it didn't happen in a vacuum. Hamas was, was trained, funded, given intelligence, given propaganda by a regime that is one of the top three uh, evil regimes of the world, Russia, Iran, China. Um, historically, it's important to recognize that the West's intellectuals are implicated in this when the revolution happened in Iran. Michel Foucault was ecstatic. And he thought that it was a real, uh, it was genuine. It was a real response. It was real freedom. And he didn't change his mind until homosexuals were being executed. And basically there was, there was no way that he couldn't acknowledge what was happening. Um, there's a certain kind of um, self-loathing, resentment, cynicism, naivete in the West that allows these kinds of ideologies of uh, Islamic um, uh, fundamentalism, radicalism, whatever we want to, ta uh, to uh, call it, to take shape until it's too late, until there's a totalitarian control and it's seeping everywhere. And what's particularly um, concerning to me is that the, the, the denialism is not limited geographically to the Middle East because of the immigration of a large number of Muslims, particularly to Europe, um, there is a sense of pr that progressives, well-meaning people, good-hearted people should close their eyes to how um, Islamic rad radicalism has uh, really entered the Western the Western world. And um, the denial about the those dangers is, I think, what um, allows and what what empowers authoritarian uh, leaders and thinking on the uh, far right to emerge and where I kind of differ from people like Ann Applebaum who think that, uh, whose book I, I loved, um, the last book in particular, um, Twilight, Twilight of Democracy. Um, but in that book, I noticed a consistent thread of um, den denial about the danger of uh, immigration from Muslim lands um, and the cultural rel relativism doesn't just harm uh, the people in the Middle East and, and women in the Middle East, and now, uh, of course, Israeli women included. It's antithetical to liberal democracy and secular government and um, our own values here in the West. Finally, I want to uh, close by saying that um, there is a solution and um, it's not to say that if we do this one thing, everything will be solved. By, by not doing this one thing, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. And that is to um, support the people of Iran because they are, believe me, uh, pro-America, pro-Israel, pro-Jewish, extremely ashamed of what October 7th is about. And if we support their democracy movement, if we support their woman life freedom movement, if we give them a chance, then the kind of future that they can build will be uh, of a free country that will uh, fight alongside Israel and the West, um, the Islamic radicals and uh, terrorists. Thank you so much. Tadaraba, Mariam. Not everyone needs to be uh, Jewish. We're very grateful for your moving and incisive uh, remarks to Shekular, to Shkarderim, as we say here in uh, Turkey. Thank you so much. We'll see what we can do vis-a-vis -vis your critical remarks on Applebaum to pry you away from the bulwark. Uh, that may take some time, but um it's now time having heard from a most remarkable um 
journalist and public intellectual and a most remarkable public intellectual and activist, indeed a most remarkable, to my mind, to my heart, theorist, because I grew up in the age of theory and I'm just stuck with that. And that's partly why I'm here with Telos tonight. Um, I couldn't be a, a bigger fan of uh, Compact uh, Magazine and the work that um, Sarah Bomari and Nina Power have been doing there. Nina, the floor or the Zoom screen, it's yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gabby, and thank you, Batya and Mariam, um, for your 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 talks or in, you know intervention statements. Um, just to be clear from the beginning, um, I'm also not Jewish. I'm not Israeli. I've never visited Israel. I'm I'm merely stating this as a matter of fact, um, and I I'm going to restrict my comments to. Um, things that I, I think I understand more. I don't want to make comments and talk about things that I'm not, um, you know, party to or heavily invested in, although I, I, I you know, absolutely understand thing, both of what things you're both saying. And um, yeah, I, I so I suppose where I'm coming from on this is partly as somebody who um, used to be on the left and maybe can recognize some of the shifts that have occurred, these kind of deleterious um, uh, horrors that have meant that we've ended up in this place where questions of internationalism, questions of solidarity, questions of understanding the reality of women's experience um, have disappeared completely. They've been eroded. Um, there is no uh, internationalism on the left anymore. There is simply what uh, Batia has described, which is uh, a, a almost Manichaean worldview of oppressor and oppressed. We're, we're quite used to understanding this, I think, and maybe this is partly what I want to go into a little bit, like to try to go deeper on why this has happened. You know, we, we there's no longer this universalism. I would say most of the left are no longer interested in things like economic analysis or class, you know, even to talk about class is an issue. And I and an example of this came to mind thinking about what has what has happened in the UK. Um, you know, we've had Muslim grooming gangs for, for 30 years that people were too afraid, uh, the authorities were too afraid to intervene in. And these targeted young and vulnerable white working class girls in poor cities and towns. And uh, the authorities, uh, whether it be the police or the councils or, or any anyone around, were too afraid to intervene into this situation because of fear of being accused of racism. Um, and we can see already in Western countries precisely how uh, both sex and economic class uh, become like these floating signifiers. If you're a poor white working class woman or a girl, you are not uh, important, right? You're... you're um, your relative status in the hierarchy of oppression will 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 you know clatter down to the bottom somewhere. And I think precisely I agree with with Batya in this this question of um, this this bizarre movement of status where Jewish people are perceived to be white when it suits uh, a narrative that Jewish people are somehow the oppressors. Um, and we just ignore all all of the historical record. Um, and similarly, and and the the similarities and differences would be worth unpacking. We, we it's a complicated, very complicated thing. But the way in which uh, women have become a floating signifier, and in some cases, precisely have become uh, oppressors, <laughs> um, you know, by virtue of a, a particular kind of womanhood. Um, and I think we absolutely saw that play out. I was, it was very interesting to me that Batya picked up on the almost like the joy and the the kind of jouissance of the 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 women in the uh, festival as something that was itself um, depicted in a negative light, right? That this was something that not to celebrate, but something to um, abhor on the part. And I, I'm not even sure we should call what is happening the left anymore. I still have residual <laughs> commitment to, a, a, you know, a material, a properly materialist analysis that would understand the role of class. And actually also there used to be a left that understood the history of women as well. And, you know, we have to understand that I think the concerted attack on what I would call genuine feminism, which is the genuine recognition of the reality of women, uh, 
as a different <laughs> sex, <laughs> you know, and the fact that we even have to, uh, you know, I mean, I, I was cancelled for, for saying that, that you know, sex was real and important in some instances. And uh, this was hardly a controversial statement until the last few years. And, you know, the the level of, of um, you know, hatred you get for defending the reality of women's existence um, makes it almost impossible, therefore, to then extend that analysis to any kind of international solidarity, which is precisely why one of the main reasons why feminism so called it's not feminism it's a uh, uh, it's something else it's it's a very um evil form of manipulation of words really because if you can't if women can't identify with other women even in their own country or across social class or economic class then they're not uh, being allowed to identify they can't identify with women elsewhere right let alone jewish women or muslim women or women in other countries and so all of these forms of solidarity and internationalism have, have been eroded in some very very cunning series of um i don't know i even how to call it like detachments or re you know replacements um words themselves are being kind of completely twisted and you know i think the attack on in particular second wave feminism that we've seen on the left as if all of these theorists, all these women, all these thinkers just have to be abandoned um, is part and parcel of this kind of, um, you know, attempt to deny that women women have a reality and that they are a class um, in the world and, and, you know, that we are half of humanity. Um, and it's to prevent these forms of solidarity across nations. Um, and so there's this going on. <laughs> and uh, alongside the status divisions, like we, like I said, in the UK, white working class girls were abandoned uh, in favour of precisely imagining that Muslim men were somehow more oppressed and that you could just, uh, it didn't matter about these poor white working class girls, because who cares, frankly. Um, and at the same time, we have this, this kind of um, rise of a certain fantasy. I, I mean, Batya talked about um, precisely um, almost like a hierarchy of oppression that the, the world is is back to this Manichaean idea not that we're all capable of harm and being harmed that we're all both uh, oppressors and oppressed in various situations no nothing like this no no kind of uh understanding of the complexity of our own uh moral worth but really this division is is between only two groups of people and women can shift around in this. Jewish people can shift around in this hierarchy depending on the situation. Um, but I think, you know, the person who comes closest to diagnosing this, uh, one of the people is, is René Girard, who's this great kind of uh, uh, Catholic thinker um, who tries to analyze where we've ended up in this, um, you know, scenario where all of these grand narratives have collapsed yet nevertheless people are clinging on to what he calls victimism right and victimism is not the same as understanding how people are hurt or how groups of people have been targeted or you know the it, precisely these forms of violence that we're talking about but rather to understand it as a kind of psychic and political and social mechanism and he defines victimism at the end of the 90s in the following way victimism uses the ideology of concern for victims to gain political or economic or spiritual power. It is not genuine concern <laughs> for, for the harm that has been caused, right? We, as human beings, we might think, you know, two wrongs don't make a right, or there is violence going on here, there's violence happening here, right? We're all capable of it, we're all capable of receiving it. Victimism denies this. It thinks that identifying with victims whoever they are in the particular uh, moment, the contemporary ideology, um, this is how you get power in this particular regime or this particular environment. So this is why people can at once defend Me Too and talk about how awful it is, like, you know, that women are being oppressed in the workplace and how bad dates are the worst thing that could ever happen to a woman, um, and then turn around and, and ignore uh, rape or turn around and ignore um, violence against women in other countries where it doesn't fit the narrative. Oh, oh well, they're not really human, as Mariam said. Oh, they're not really women in the same way that we're women. Or, oh, they deserved it because they're richer. Or they deserved it because whatever, right? You know, so these things can happen at the same time, even though they make no sense logically, politically, um, or anything like that, because victimism 
which uses the ideology of concern for victims is a moving feast, right? So whoever the victim is, is going to shift and change. And this is exactly what we've seen, right? This is what people do to get power and status within the regime. And if they can't make currency out of um, people, even though they've clearly suffered, if, you know, they've clearly been uh, the target of violence, um, then they are useless. We have victimism by proxy um, across the West. This over-identification, um, and Batia mentioned identification, this over-identification of rich or middle-class <laughs> Westerners with a perceived group, which precisely uh, denies agency, as you both suggested, um, is a kind of uh, cosplay. You know, this is a, a form of a political game playing um, that is grotesque. If you ask any one of these middle class people, well, would you go and fight? Would you go over there? You know, I knew people on the far left who did do that, right? Who did go and fight um, in various places in Rojava and elsewhere, right? They they actually did do it. Very small numbers of people, but they did, right? If you ask your average middle class person who is protesting on the streets of London every week, um, supposedly pro-Palestinian and so on, on the side of the oppressed, would you go and fight? Absolutely none of them would, right? This is not reality to them. This is a form of uh, acting, to be honest, in this victimism uh, arena. It is a, a game of a certain spectacle that that people can play when they are not really invested and they're not really bothered and it, it's absolutely horrific and the fact that these people are uh acting as the righteous ones uh just makes it all the worse but this is how people have to justify it to themselves because there's nothing more delicious than pretending um to be good to you know while actually acting in a sadistic and um asymmetrical and uh, de facto violent manner and defending violence. Thank you, Nina. Thank you all. Victims by proxy. Indeed, Rene Girard, the theorist of the moment. On a personal note, I was re reading Girard before Girard was cool. He used to be considered sort of conservative or not really radical, you know, and now all of a sudden that's okay. So thanks to Red Scare, we can all read Rene Girard, but um, seriously, that that jouissance is, is um, certainly remarkable in the case of the Israelis, and yet it's a two-edged sword, as we know. There's a jouissance at work in the Hamas uh, necro terrorists as well, isn't there? Um, but anyway, uh, I've got tons of questions written down. I'm sure the audience does too. I'd rather start by turning to you three uh, before getting to, to to any more specific questions from anyone one else, and ask if you have questions uh, for for each other. Um, anything you'd like to raise for discussion among the the three of you? I'm definitely still digesting. Um, those talks were both just absolutely brilliant. Um, so much is going to stay with me. I think, Nina, your your last line, I'm just going to read it again so people understand like how genius this is. You said, there's nothing more delicious than pretending to be good while acting in a sadistic manner. And um, I just think that that's really really deep and i think it came up in all three of our presentations this idea of sort of the pleasures of sadism in the name of some sort of ideology um and and the role of acting um in all of this i i really had never thought of that so thank you both so much just totally totally brilliant i was kind of paraphrasing aldous huxley and uh many others have noted this kind of uh pleasure in the the kind of righteous cruelty and i think you know, we've seen a lot of that um, among people who maybe feel guilty economically for being moderately well off. They can nevertheless like do this by proxy victimism thing. Um, and, you know, we need to we need to be thinking in this kind of psychosocial way, like to drag diagnose these problems, I think. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to maybe ask both of you more, more positively, I suppose, like, you know, this question of a restoration of an internationalism or a solidarity between women, you know, when on the one hand, women in the West are trying to battle that, like, the very idea that we're allowed to use the word wo woman or that it doesn't mean what we always used to mean by it, you know, and okay, that's, that's actually relatively um, minor compared to the obvious um, physical repression of women on the basis of them being women, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, the one is making solidarity with the other really difficult. And I mean, you both spoke, I, I don't know how to, to ask this, but, you know, how do we get to a, a back almost to a, a feminist universalism that sees a uh, fundamental, you know, sees an identification, sees a universality in the female sex. And because this has been smashed, like deliberately, let's be clear. I mean, this solidarity has been smashed. It's not in men's interest or particular kinds of men, not all men, <laughs> but it's not in the interest, you know, it's not in, I don't know. How do, how do we get to this feminist internationalism for want of a better phrase? Mariam, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, how do we get this? I guess that is the question because we can't, I, I don't like to um, just talk about what's wrong. Uh, we need to solve it. We need to have ideas about how to be better, um, how to prevent things from getting worse at least. How do we get back to feminist universalism? I guess one way is maybe to think about what feminist universalism had as its characteristics, uh, had as its approaches. How did women act and, and, and interact with each other from one part of the world uh, to another part of the world? I mean, Tehran was going to be the, uh, uh, the host city for an international conference on women's rights, believe it or not, right before the revolution happened. Um, that was the time of when uh, sisterhood is global, that kind of thinking. When there was a feminist um, scholar in the West, she or he would be somebody that Iranians would be reading. Now, if there's a feminist scholar, the person is being cursed in Iran by anyone who is even remotely kind of involved in in trying to create a democratic country, trying to create a, a, a place where there's equality between men and women. Um, in some ways, I think we need to be listening to people who are fighting for women's rights in places like Iran, if we wanna rehabilitate the idea of, of what feminism should be in the future, because they are um, fighting the, the, the classical liberal fight of uh, just equality, you know, that, that, that we have so much to be thankful for when um, we have a legal system that treats everybody equally. It's like, it's like the West is trying to, you know, uh, the Western notion of progress seems to be to push things so that it isn't that way. Um, or to not even be, uh, you know, grateful for the US constitution, for example, um, to put everything under so much scrutiny that we end up losing any sense of, of value and distinction between good and evil. So I would say maybe actually we need to go back and look at what, what defined th th that feminism and what people in, on the ground in places like Afghanistan and Iran are saying. By the way, I don't mean to say that every single person who's Iranian and considers themselves feminist has a problem with Western feminism. Unfortunately, that's not the case. There's a lot of a seepage of like postmodern thinking into Iran. And in fact, um, no surprise, I guess, the regime uh, okays the publication of, of thinkers like Zizek and, and uh, like, because it, it, suits their, uh, it suits their vision. It suits their totalitarianism. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Nina. <laughs> I'm sorry. Compact has published Zizek too. <laughs> I must, yeah. as well as Batya. I mean, we, you know, like <laughs> we're both good. Zizek is everywhere. He's like uh, Hashem. His center is nowhere. <laughs> His circumference is, yeah. 
I'm happy to be known as the anti Zizek or the other side of whatever polarity he's he's on. Um, I guess what I would say um, to your question, Nina, is um, I I really felt like after the Me Too movement, like I wasn't quite sure what really was left <laughs> for feminists to say. I mean, it, it really for the upper middle class women that it was created to protect, right? Because obviously like working class women are still suffering from a lot of the stuff that was changed through Me Too. But for the women it was designed to protect, it was a huge game changer. I mean, it used to be you would go into a workplace as a woman and every man would decide like to what extent like your relationship with them was going to have an element of flirtation or have a sexual tinge to it. Now I feel that after Me Too, that decision was given entirely to women. Men are incredibly afraid of having their careers destroyed and you know women have gotten a lot of power out of that and in that social setting in you know sort of white collar america let's say i'll just limit it to that um and the the things that people still struggle with um they, to me they seem more like human issues like you know in america like you know fair wages for your labor you know like non-alienated work um, I don't know that that's, I mean, it, it, it's very difficult for single moms, but men in America are really struggling right now, working class men without a college degree with things that used to be like women's struggles, like a sense of self-esteem, a sense of agency, a sense that, you know, you, ha you have mastery over your fate and your life. And I don't, God forbid, mean to like downplay sexual violence. I think that still exists, but um you know, there was something that happened during Me Too as well. It's funny that that became kind of a theme in this conversation, but you would have stories coming out in which women would be sort of weeping over having been given a promotion because their boss flirted with them. And then you would have men try to be like, oh, you know, that same boss used to throw books at my head. <laughs> and everyone would be like, shut up. No one wants to hear that. Right. And there was this kind of disparity between like, the the I mean obviously there was really bad stuff that that me too you know as I was saying eradicated and you know in a good way but there there like there's this feeling that like um it, it, I I just I'm not really sure where to go like with this there are of course cultures where um the sexual violence is still the norm but I don't live in one of them I live in one in which like the contempt for the working class is the biggest problem we have. And that is very non-gendered. And to the extent that the trans situation is is um, impacting women in a negative way, where you have things like, you know, a rapist who goes to prison and says, now I'm trans and gets put in a women's prison or, you know, beating up, you know, young girls on their sports teams. Those are very important problems, I think. But they're sort of like, they're they're, they're cl classified under just things that should be actual crimes like you know beating people up or raping people right so i feel like i'm not even sure that there's and by the way i feel this way about the kind of the special pleading that jewish students at harvard have been engaged in like um i i feel very little sympathy for that and um for, for a similar reason like the things that are crimes are already crimes i don't believe in speech crimes i don't believe in hate crimes i don't believe that like you should be punished more because of the thought that was in your head when you created a crime so I, I, to me, it's more important to have like specific attention to specific issues than to revive a kind of internationalist. Like I'm embarrassed I haven't spoken up more on behalf of women in Iran, but that's a specific thing. Like I should be more focused on that issue rather, not as a woman, but as a human and as a Jew, like I should care about that and I should speak up about that and, and everybody should. It's hard for me to see myself in any way as uh, beleaguered or um, um, oppressed. Lucky me. <laughs> we, we, we have uh, a question from uh, Russell Berman of the Hoover Institution. If he would join us. Hi, Russell. Oh, you're, you're muted. How, how about now? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for... Um... Uh, thanks for all of these, these um, as they say, wonderful talks, these excellent talks, very compelling. Um, I struggle with the, um, with, the, with the adjective because the topic is so devastating. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the topic is uh, the Hamas attack on October 7th and the violence um, against women that uh, transpired there. Um, but it's, um, it's part of a bigger picture, and I therefore want to... Um, um, subscribe uh, absolutely to what uh, Miriam said, that uh, if we're going to um, 
think through what happened, what happens with Hamas, what happens with Hezbollah, what happens with the Houthis, we have to think about Iran. Uh, Iran, the regime there is the root cause. The lack of one has to stand for democracy in Iran for on its own right, uh, because it's the right thing to do, but also because of the implications throughout the region and throughout the world. Um, uh, Miriam, I want to thank you also for um, mentioning the book by my former colleague, Beverly Allen, uh, on, uh, on rape warfare, which talked about the Yugoslav violence, um, where um, many of the victims were Muslim women. Uh, so um, this this works in in different directions, and of course, many of the, the victim the women who are victims in Afghanistan or Iran are largely Muslim women. Um, but this brings me to um, the question about how we might think about Hamas. One way or the other, the left believes it's a kind of national liberation movement. Uh, one way or another, Western politicians are trying to think of it, they don't say national liberation, but it's a nationalist movement. Um, and to do that, you um, sort of marginalize the violence against women. That was an excess that took place as opposed to the real, the imputed real agenda. But especially after this panel, I wonder, you know, shouldn't we think of Hamas as more like Boko Haram in Nigeria? Shouldn't we think of it more like ISIS and the Yazidis? Is there a kind of programmatic misogyny that stretches across the region that is not a secondary factor, but is a central factor to what is transpiring in the, in the Middle East? How do we understand Hamas? That's my question. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's at the core of the ideology of Islamic radicalism or Islamic fundamentalism. It always has been. Uh, I think it's just a, uh, it's not an oversimplification to say that the West doesn't see those women as equal. And so it has had a blind spot in understanding what the, that political ideology is all about. It's, it's really first and foremost about the subjugation of women. And the first people who rose up against the Islamic Republic, including my mom was among them, were women. Uh, women came out and marched and they were beaten at that time and they lost, they were a minority. Some men, some men stood behind them, but basically that struggle continues. And until the West recognizes that its own future, its own future, as a free civilization is, um, is dependent on who wins that struggle, then, um, then Western civilization is going to be in peril. And it, it, and it really is not too much to say that, um, that immigration from the Middle East is going to uh, be a danger for um, uh, liberal democracies, Western civilization, because um, a lot of the places where uh, people can't live anymore in the Middle East, the people who are migrating are not necessarily um, believers in in gender equality. I mean, look at the look at the the rapes that have happened in Germany and other places, and and this this idea that well we shouldn't talk about it because um, again the the totem pole of identity, the fact that these are Muslim men who've come to our country, you know, we would be bad hosts if we were being honest about the fact that they just um, raped women here. Um, women keep getting pushed down further and further on the totem pole. And it's it, the irony is that it's all in the name of, of progress. Thank you. Misogyny, programmatic misogyny. Um, Dr. Berman refers to. It seems to me Hamas is more like ISIS uh, than than anything. But I can't help wondering if I may insert a, a question, uh, piggybacking off of uh, Russell's. If there's a programmatic misogyny at work uh, in the Middle East, how? Is is there perhaps, and this is rather speculative, a, a misogyny by proxy at work in the West 
what, what, how, how is it that the West receives uh, the misogyny, the medieval misogyny of this other region uh, with such, uh, I don't know, gratitude. It, it, it's, like a, a, it's, it's like the nightmarish world of Michelle Wilbeck or something. Yeah, I mean, I think this is actually a really crucial question. Like, how does the weird misogyny in the left, which means like women can't use the word women <laughs> to mean what it always meant, um, intersect with this, uh, I don't know, indifference to or indeed de facto uh, acceptance of misogyny elsewhere, right? Like, it does, like, how do these two things work together? On the one hand, it's like, no, you can't talk about women or the word woman doesn't belong to you or it it means whatever anyone wants it to mean or wherever we're at with that and therefore the category is dissolved and on the other hand the women are dissolved right like I don't know we just disappear in different ways but I think that this is a crucial question I'm just basically reiterating your question which is how do these intersect because they clearly do they clearly bolster one another but like pinning it down how they do is really complicated Outstanding. This is work uh, to be done then. Uh, any other comments on this work to be done to figure out the intersection of, of these different regions uh, uh, overlapping in terms of the most grotesque misogyny imaginable? Um, I, I will just say I, I live in um, uh, a, a, an immigrant neighborhood that has many immigrants from many different places, but there's a big Turkish faction um, and something you'll see a lot in the restaurants is families where half of the women are wearing hijab and half of the women are not. And doesn't necessarily, um, it's not like a kind of like the older women are always and the younger women are not. There's often groups of friends, girlfriends, like groups where half are wearing it and half are not. And it's, it's, it, it, it just fills me with joy. I mean, and, and pride, national pride and patriotism, like, because of course that's how it should be, right? People should be in a situation where they can choose a lifestyle that, that, that has meaning for them and they can choose um, to, to follow their religion in a way that um, is, you know, that, that, that not under duress, but from a position of choice. And um, it's, so I, 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 to me, it's sort of like, I wish I would, I could stop them and ask them, well, how do you guys feel about all of these Westerners supporting Hamas, which if you lived in Gaza, you would not have this choice. You would not have the choice to have these friends. You would not have the choice to be religious in this way. Um, because I wonder really what they would say about it. I, I, we definitely have, we have not had in my neighborhood, any March pro Hamas marching. There's no flags. Like it's all a very, it's, I think, that has a lot more to do with class, actually. And I think that's why the marching in America is only on university campuses, pretty much. We, we The kinds of Muslims who can't afford to move to America tend to be middle class. And once you're middle class and you're living next to middle class neighbors, like all you really want is like to have quiet and peace and have a nice life for your kids. So it's just very, um, there's not a lot of like, you know, um, um, agita around this and ironically um at some point they they hung an israeli flag um in the neighborhood on the canal and i i did not like that i didn't feel good about it and i was sort of agitating against it and people got really upset at me they're like but yeah you're so pro-israel so, but we should be respectful of our neighbors like why should we rub it in their faces they've not been rubbing anything in my face like i i understand they probably have different views on this issue but now me well maybe they don't like maybe they really like that they live in a place where it's their choice how to treat their daughters, how to treat their children, and how to observe their their religion, including for women. Any further uh, comments in response to uh, Russell Berman? We have Carrie Nelson waiting to join in. I could ask you folks questions all night. I am here in Turkey since you mentioned it, and I noticed too the the uh, variation of head coverings. Uh, it's it's kind of just up for grabs here. Uh, far be it for me to to praise uh, um, a, a Muslim Brotherhood government, but but <laughs> I, I take your point. Uh, uh, compared to Amman, Jordan, where I was before this, uh, I'm pretty cool with 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 Turkey at the at least in Istanbul at the moment. But Carrie Nelson might have a a question. I I I don't know if this is going to throw it off. Of course, but ah, there's Carrie. Uh, I'll save my uh, 
peculiar question for later. Yeah, I just want to that. Yeah. Nice um, to see you. Good to see you. Um, I I think this is one of the most compelling set of presentations I've ever heard in my time on Earth. <laughs> um, I think I really think anyone with any pretense to political analysis ought to hear this. So as soon as the recording is available, let's get it out everywhere and uh, insist that life must not continue until people have <laughs> listened to these remarkable presentations. Um, I do have a question, but my partner is actually sitting here kind of off screen, uh, Paula Treichler, who is- um, Hey, Paula. Hi. <laughs> has some feminist books to her credit. Which one of yeah, that? Yeah, indeed but, she does. Paula uh, Treichler has a few feminist credentials, I think. Yeah, quite a few. But uh, I'll tell you, I was very happy to start writing about um, the AIDS epidemic and, and working with gay men and getting away from feminists. <laughs> it was such a relief. Um, I mean, gay men have their own problems, right? But uh, the feminist movement is just... Um, well, as you said, it shouldn't even be called feminism anymore. I don't know what to call it, except that uh, the things that I think we mm -hmm. believed in the 80s and 90s, um, and maybe some remnant of that helped uh, propel the Me Too movement, which I have a lot of doubts about. I think it did untold damage, um, but... But it, it sort of had to happen. But my the question I want to put to you guys, <laughs> you gals, is um, when you think about the United States today and the notion of alternative facts, let's say, of uh, even newscasters, you know, in Champaign, Illinois, using false narrative, you know, in their everyday remarks, um, I think that what you said about postmodernism uh, really weakening that notion of good versus evil mm -hmm. and right versus wrong has infused so much in the United States and has led to the rise of Trump, of Trumpism, um, you know, some the embrace of, um, I mean, the questioning of the Constitution of liberal values, of, uh, you know, the rights of man, all those things that make us happy about our country mm -hmm. are being diffused, are being, um, I mean, alternative facts. Well, we just don't see it that way. We see the Constitution as oppressive, as something that we can just do without. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that a bit. Please, folks, let's hear it and don't hold uh, back, uh, including on the topic of Trump and the rights of man, who some people might see as a reaction indeed to this whole set of problems we're dealing with. But I know intelligent people who understand it that way without much regret. For a long time, I didn't read anything by men. This was in the 70s. <laughs> Then we had a conference here on Marxism and the interpretation of culture. Um, and Stuart Hall spoke and I went to all of his lectures and I changed my mind and decided that there were some men who were worth reading. Um, he was you know, very eloquent, very intelligent. Um, a, a good looking, good looking. Yeah, yeah, very good looking, yeah. Charming, uh, I love um, Stuart. I'd love, yeah. love to okay, see. so so I got interested in theory and began moving away from um, my feminist colleagues who were anti-theory, anti-male, um, and I was involved with uh, two other feminists in creating a book called The Feminist Dictionary, which we published in 1985. And the first half of it was done by one of these um, anti-male feminists, and the second half, the definitions were done by mostly me. And so 
you know, in the first half, you get a a definition of erection, for example, that's that's just grotesque. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the dribblings of an impotent man. I mean, something like that. And in and then rock and roll is one of my entries, which is in the second half. And they objected to that. Rock and roll is a male dominated, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, um, theory then became very empowering. And my book on the AIDS epidemic, which is called How to Have Theory in an Epidemic, um, is about the way that you can use those ideas to look at these scientific findings, the way they're put forward to the uh, public. Anyway, I was very, it was very useful. But now, <clears throat> now what you've been saying is so clear that theory gives gives people an alibi to say anything. Um, it lets you say black is white. It lets you say this sentence does not mean what it seems to mean. You know, it, it makes everything up for grabs. And it just, it bothers me very much. And your talks have been... Uh, so illuminating because they they give language and specifics to that sense of mind. I really thank you for these. And I guess I'll be doing a written response. Um, you are the written respondent to this panel, which will be published on Telescope shortly. We've invited you because, well, Paula, you're, you're you. When I was at UC Santa Cruz, of all places. Yeah, speaking uh, of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I hate to tell you, but you were uh, so revered, more so even than the one of the editors of that volume of cultural Lechema Jimmy and Marx's what's it? I mean, uh, coming from you, this is all much appreciated. We look forward to your written response to this panel, which yeah. will be published soon on Telescope. Uh, and I love this uh, phrase, an alibi to say anything i'm afraid that's what uh theory has has devolved into what about the panelists uh i'll just say very briefly because i um i think it's so important what you brought up and to me um the so i i <laughs> something that i try to explain to people about the university right now from having gotten a phd is you know when you get a phd in the humanities more often than not which of course you know but more often than not you're what you're doing is you're taking a bunch of books that have been around for 400 years, which people who are, in my case, who are much smarter than me have been writing about for 400 years, for 300 years, meaning that everything that is true about these books has already been said. But you can't get a PhD and write a PhD thesis and just say like, oh, actually, this 19th century person got it right when he was looking at this 17th century text. You have to say something new. And so there is a huge premium placed on the counterintuitive, which is I think why postmodernism and all of this French structuralism <laughs> took such deep root in American academia, because that well, is literally the pathway to getting this degree. Like not only does, as Thomas Wolfe pointed out, in order to get um, status, you have to distance yourself from the middle class and the obvious and like good hearted middle class values, especially now that middle class Americans are no longer, you know, racist. Um, you, you, got, you can't just say like, oh, actually, Dr. King was right and get a PhD. You have to now say, <laughs> Dr. King was the real racist. Colorblind yeah. is the real racism, right? The counterintuitive reversal, because you that your whole career depends on being able to say something original, which means probably if you're an honest person, you're not going to be saying something true. So to me, you couple that with the fact that a third of Americans now have a degree. All of those people, not all of them are have degrees in humanities, but to get a degree, you have to take Comp 101, which is being taught to you by a nincompoop like me who got a PhD, <laughs> who made something up about books that people much smarter than me have been talking about for 300 years. And I think that the college divide, the class divide is where Trump comes from. I don't think that's bad. I actually think Trump's a pretty good thing. He did a lot of really good things for this country. I know it's verboten to, to admit, but um, that he was the result of the kind of return of the repressed of the working class. He is the return of the repressed of the working class who had been told by these nincompoops like me who have been sitting there staring making literally making stuff up as a career that th that gave them this sense that they're better than normal americans who are like no actually i want to live in a colorblind society and that the combination of economic good fortune being so much richer than average americans coupled with having this ridiculous like 
a worldview based on all of these, we we're talking about the wokeness, the post-structuralism, all this, you know, um, that combination is lethal because they were both richer and much less good than the average person. And so they had to come up with a worldview that justified their privilege so they could still keep thinking they were better than everybody else to justify their status. So a long way of saying, I totally agree with you. <laughs> I totally agree with you. Pressing <laughs> on this point, but yeah, you, you, you've you hit it on the head. I think the same thing is true about the art world. I'm, I'm a painter, abstract painter. And I feel like the only time anything is taken seriously is if it's something that is anti, uh, you know, to be new and different has to be anti anything almost beautiful. You know, it's like, well, because beauty has been done, you can't do it anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I had a question. Um, th there are several themes that run through all three presentations. And the variations on them are just really fascinating and wonderful. But one I wanted to ask about, well, I'm more than one, but one, I'll take one. Um, one continuous theme is a contrast between what one might call intersectional feminism, which is highly selective in what it will recognize to intersect with and not intersect with. Mm -hmm. And um, Yes, Gabe, I've decided that, inter that intersectional feminism is a thing. Uh, we I def finally convinced you of one thing after we, we, 40 years. Over this for a couple of decades, and I guess you've won, damn. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's contrasted with a much broader universalizing kind of solidarity. Is the plea for that more universalizing feminist solidarity possible in our world or is the moment simply gone yeah maybe i'll just come in on on this one i mean i think if you read kimberly crenshaw text where the the idea of intersectional feminism comes from this is a legal this is a, a this is a essay about the legal system and about the way in which she was looking at uh black women who are also poor and that these two things like intersected to contribute to like, let's say um, harsher sentencing or whatever, or a more unjust treatment in the legal system. The, the basis upon which she makes this claim, maybe this is a you know good analysis in that particular environment, but it's based on a zero sum game model, <laughs> right? And this is where the kind of hierarchy and oppression thing comes back in because precisely as Batya and others were saying, it's, it's you know, then it becomes like, uh, a kind of game of like who is placed where and, and so on. So when people invoke intersectional feminism, and you somehow end up with men who pretend to be women uh, as being the most oppressed, right? Okay, well, clearly this is deranged. Like clearly something has gone very badly wrong when we're somehow supposed to defend the rights of like men who want to sexually abuse actual women in prison and somehow they're the most, like this is clearly deranged, right? So I think in order to get back to reality or any kind of um, internationalism, universalism, we have to basically defend things that no one ever thought we would have to defend, which is the reality of uh, female existence in the first place. Um, you know, it, and it's so insane that we have to do this when it's so obvious that women are being treated as women or precisely on the basis of being women in particular situations where there are mass rapes, for example, right? You know, of course, men can be raped too, but when women are being particularly, you know, treated as women negatively, they are definitely being decided, you know, on the basis of their of their sex, right? This is, you know, reality. And so we have to kind of get back to this basic assertion of of sexual difference um, and to start from that. And I think within understanding the context of victimism and this diagnosis of, well, people are playing zero sum power games by identifying with, uh, you know, different groups that they are deciding are oppressed in particular situations temporarily, because these groups shift, as we've noticed, um, we have to say, like, we're not playing the zero sum game, right? We are talking about statements of fact, men exist, women exist. We are similar in some ways, but we are also different. And these are the, diff you know, that like it's stuff like this, right? We have to go back to, or go forward to reality. 
God forbid, we should go back to reality. Baya Unger, Sargon has to go back to her busy uh, schedule, look for her on HBO, NBC, ABC, CBS, uh, wherever, and, and so on and so forth and everywhere. God bless. And uh, let's continue our conversation with enormous thanks to my uh, hero and uh, two more of them still here. And Carrie, well, not so much. Um, listen, folks, <laughs> I say it with love. Um, any further response to that? I don't want to cut that off. And then we have more questions in the queue. My esteemed colleague, uh, um, Nellie Cooper, author of numerous books on uh, uh, French uh, uh, theory and culture and 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 uh, literature and so on, an erudite person who dares to ask, and I throw it out after Baya left, that leaves you, Nina. <laughs> She asks, isn't it Trump who defunded UNRWA? And didn't Biden start uh, again the funding of this organization of which many, many of its employees participated in October 7th? What does the bulwark have to say about that, my old friend, Mariam? That's me ventriloquizing uh, Nellie Cooper. I mean, You're asking I, me? I, I, yeah, I'm asking you. I really don't know enough to say, um, but I have a very good friend, someone I respect very much, Hillel Neuer of UN Watch, and he has led a campaign to uh, defund and condemn UNRWA and to you know go back to the drawing board and, and have a real entity. Uh, and so I really defer to people like him because... I have implicit trust on 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 that issue with him. Yeah, it seems no, pretty I, I well know. proven now that the people who work there uh, had. Well, I mean, in the past, it was proven that the school books were teaching things that no school book should teach, much less one funded by the UN. Hate hate of of Jews in Israel, and then now, um, you know. Uh, direct involvement in October 7th. Um, we, we've known this for decades. My friend Asaf Romorowski wrote a book on this decades ago. And um, look, I mean, I, I, I absolutely appreciate your, your comments. And I know that you were not unaware of this for a long, long time. Any Anything else on um, the fact that, like it or not, Trump and call it Trumpism, if you will, actually, by its nature, stands against UNRWA. And Biden, his party is more or less inclined to actually fund such organizations. I well, this we is the problem. Go. Yeah, this is the problem of our times, in my opinion, to uh, with regards to the Middle East as a whole. So on um, the the we're stuck between Iraq and a hard place in that. I Iraq and Iran and a hard place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the Trump policy on the Middle East was really just a much better policy when it came to protecting national U.S. national security, global security, by keeping back um, the um, Iran's regime. And, and all its proxy forces, including, you know, Hamas. And I don't think that what happened to Israel would have happened when Trump was in power because there was a maximum pressure strategy on Iran's regime. And I don't think that there's an argument to be made that if the disastrous pullout of Afghanistan hadn't happened, directly because of Biden's actions. I mean, yes, the Trump administration sat down with the Taliban and made it made a plan, made a promise for the United States to leave, but that didn't mean that that the leaving had to be in this way. And I don't think that like a secretary of state like Pompeo would have allowed, you know, Bagram Air Force Base and and all our commitments to be abandoned in, in that way. Um, and they said so. Um, and so if 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 Biden hadn't done that, I'd, I don't know if Putin would have had uh, so much 
you know, arrogance to 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 attack Ukraine the way that he did. So, I mean, there really isn't any aspect of U.S. foreign policy that I don't think was better under Trump. But the problem is that, you know, the rock and hard place problem is that um, a lot of people who believe in those policies, foreign policies, domestic policies, don't want Trump because of what he's done to um, to our uh, to democracy. I mean, even before January sixth, um, even before the two thousand sixteen election, there were there were people on the right who really believed in these policies strongly, who were not willing to vote for someone who so clearly had a discourse and demeanor that was uh, antithetical to American liberal norms, democratic norms. Wow. Well, I promise not to tell Bill Crystal. you said 75% of what you just said. But, no, he um, knows. He knows. Yeah, okay. He knows I okay. think that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it's, 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 it's true. Um, I'm not sure what Compact Mag's position is on all of this. Uh, well, just quickly, we're heterodox. So, you know, I mean, we're on the side of the working person and we try to analyze and understand why populist movements are happening all over the world. Um, and, you know, we are, I guess, keen to, yeah, not only understand, but also defend um I guess these these positions because the alternative is basically uh, a kind of dismissal, uh, an understanding, uh, or a, this use of like deplorables or like you know a just a absolutely horrific um, form of misplaced superiority, precisely of the kind that Batya was talking about, produced by the universities um, and where the the sort of the PMC or the kind of I don't know faux intellectual middle class believes that it <laughs> that it has the answers um and and you know is is unable to somehow understand the concerns of normal people um of which there are millions <laughs> and uh so yeah so we 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 publish both pro biden and pro trump articles and we are just very very interested to to understand i guess more than anything rather than take uh, I don't know, predictable sides, I guess. Well, you don't, you don't do that. Uh, you're, you're the most interesting uh, journal, I think, out there today, I, I, except for Telos. Um, <laughs> I understand, I think Nina has to go. Yes, I I'm have, sorry. I have another yeah. podcast to record. I do a cinema podcast. I'll be, list I'll be um, listening soon. I, I literally, not figuratively, literally, literally never miss an episode so so keep me in mind and and say some more uh things that i would find appealing and <laughs> thank thank you but thank you so Nina. much for the invite and i think there's some very very important things that everyone said and and um work to be done you know like really on serious matters and precisely the kinds of things that people find too difficult to talk about which is why we don't talk about them and this is precisely the very things we should be talking about so Thank you for this opportunity. And it's very nice to hear Mariam and also Batya in absentia now. Wonderful to meet you, Nina. Goodbye, all. Take care. Mariam, Memar uh, Sadegi, I'm going to ask you the weirdest, most awkward question that I would never dare to ask Harvey Mansfield. <laughs> Do you see why this is a problem already? <laughs> Har Harvey has said, and this is on a completely different angle, but I'm 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 quoting that that the attack on Jewish women was an attack on Jewish men's honor. Mm. Now that's wrong. Women are not tokens for men's honor. Blah blah blah. Gabby Brahm, get out of town. <laughs> uh, I won't say more but harvey claimed in an interview recently that the hamas strategy actually was to get at i hate almost to ask this israeli men through israeli women 
I'm not endorsing the sentiment, but he claimed it was a kind of insult. Well, yeah, I mean, it's disempowering, right? It's so disempowering to humanity. Anyone watching, anyone listening, anyone hearing about it, reading about it, feels so violated. And of course, it's not that that's not to to diminish how incomparable incalculable it is to have actually experienced the rape of october 7th but i think anyone who who observes it witnesses it feels disempowered and humiliated and it must be especially so for a father a husband a brother um, a boyfriend, uh, how could it not be? That's human. That's a human bond. That's human love, right? It's not about being a man and, and they being girls and women. It's about these are the people in your life and you love them and you couldn't protect them. I mean, I heard interviews where um, men were saying that about their little boys, about how they felt guilty that they couldn't protect their little boys. Uh, so young sons so it's got to be there's got to be truth in that and nothing bad thank you so much um for for that uh i was almost going to say my friend katie herzog except i've never met her i'm now speaking in parasocial parasocial telos is a theory journal parasocial discourse i feel like i know katie herzog who is not Jewish, but nobody's perfect. She's one of the hosts. Actually, she is the only host of the um, Blocked and Reported podcast uh, with her um, uh, research assistant, Jesse Single. Um, it's an interesting uh, podcast. She, she happens to be a lesbian uh, uh, woman. She has declared herself not a feminist in recent years. Because I take it, if I can frame it this way, not because of some ideal idea of feminism or what it really means in fact, but I think from her frustration with actually and actual existing feminism, which is fourth, fifth, sixth wave, intersectional, and so on. Do you have any th thoughts about that? um affirming yeah, my, or negating of that term my own my own personal uh position at least so far has been that i still consider myself a feminist because i want to define what feminism means and i and i take a very just basic simple classical view of it is that it means the equality of men and women and uh and that that's uh, we shouldn't um and give up on the term because of of other people's um, kind of follies and mistakes. Uh, we should just try to just in in the same way that if if liberalism was being distorted, we wouldn't say, well, we're not gonna we're not gonna bother with the, the term liberalism anymore. So, thanks, Mariam. As a as a conservative American, I have to conserve liberalism since that's what America is based on. <laughs> and right. uh, uh, more, moreover, I feel I should conserve something about feminism, thanks to your uh, wise uh, remarks. I understand that you've unfortunately got to go. Hope to talk to you again soon. I want to quickly, though, throw out to the audience that we have a tr tradition here at uh, TPP, uh, I Israel Institute. We call it the after party. <laughs> and uh, that means that, yeah, I know you might want to never know you could. It's up to you. We we turn off the recording, Mario. It's up to you. And and we hang out and we talk some more um, and sometimes for a while. And and so uh, I, although our panelists may have to, to depart, we're happy to bring others on to the Zoom screen or whatever. And, and we'll turn off the recording and we'll say what we, we really think. I really think that this was not only a, a panel, but an event, uh, uh, something that, that I will never forget and that will leave, leave me with much to think about for uh, a long time. Thank you. 
Same, same, same here. I'm gonna um, thank you, and I'm I'm envious of the people who get to stick around. But um, I'm really grateful to you for inviting me and having me. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. This topic was was just so important. Thank you.